My name is Pastor Andy Fry. I'm the headmaster at the school that Trinity Bible Chapel runs, uh, King Alfred Academy. We're into our fifth year of operation, uh, so it was in 2020 when we started the school, and the Lord has been very gracious, and we're very thankful, and I'm very thankful to have all you here. Just out of curiosity, uh, could you raise your hand if you are, as of right now, educating your children in classical education? Okay. Can you raise your hand if you have no idea what classical education is? Okay, there's a few of you. Good. Don't feel bad about it. It's fine. This is why you're here. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just go with that. I'm just, I was curious about uh, what the audience was today. So this conference is called The Presence of Christ. And Pastor Jacob gave a great apologetic last night as to why we called this conference The Presence of Christ. And it's asking the question, what does it look like to have the presence of Christ in various aspects of the church? And while I do want to talk about classical Christian education today, the question that I want to bring to it is about the presence of Christ in education. And what does this look like? What does it look like to have Christ's presence in education? You see, two years ago, uh, when we had the Church of War Conference, I gave a talk about how to start a classical Christian school. Because I do believe that this is a tool that we have to fight the war in the culture, and that is to train our children well. But like I said, today I want to ponder about the presence of Christ in education. In other words, we're asking, does the way we educate matter when it comes to the presence of Christ? And then if there's time when I'm done, uh, we might open up for some questions as well, but we'll see about that, <laughs> see how long this takes. So again, question we're pondering is this. Does the way we educate matter when it comes to the presence of Christ in the education of our children? Well, for Christ to be present in education, obviously we need an education that honors Christ in what we teach. I think that's a given. And I believe truly that there are various ways of educating that will fulfill this purpose. That is a Christ-centered education. However, I do believe that there is a type of education that will set the stage best for God to use our students when his presence does manifest in our education and after. So my argument for this talk is that classical Christian education is an education that will best prepare our students when Christ does show up. And so I'm taking the presence of Christ not necessarily to mean do we have Christ in the curriculum, I'm taking the presence of Christ to mean that Christ's manifest presence is in our lives and he's going to use our children and us in order to fulfill his mandate, which is to make disciples of all nations. And does the way we educate have any, any way of making this better or worse, I guess you can say. Okay, so would you pray with me? I'll open in prayer, and then we'll kind of jump into this question that I've proposed. Our Father in heaven, I'm very thankful for everyone here. And for those that are currently classically educating their children in a Christ-centered worldview, I pray that they would be encouraged and would continue to do so. For those that are not, I pray that they would be challenged, even in their thinking. And those that for this is their first time, I pray that I would be clear in what a classical education is. And we pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start with talking about why we need Christian education. I'm going to talk about the presence of Christ. We first need to talk about how we do honor Christ in it. And really, this is the problem that we all find ourselves in at the moment. And we do have a problem. The biggest problem is that Christ's presence has not been in education for a very long time. Christ is not only not the Lord of education in most of our schooling options, but when he does regenerate a person and his presence does show up, we have produced students that are immature, pleasure-saturated, pleasure inward-looking, with no conceptual link to the rich heritage that we have in the Christian tradition. 
We are less educated than the past. And what this leads to is a prolonged childhood, well beyond where we had in the past. Consider this. Dorothy Sayers, an author and scholar from England in the 1940s, said this. When we think about the remarkably early age at which the young men went up to the university in, let's say in Tudor times, and thereafter were held fit to assume responsibility for the conduct of their own affairs, are we altogether comfortable about the artificial prolongation of intellectual childhood and adolescence into the years of physical maturity, which is so marked in our own day, this is 1948. To postpone the acceptance of responsibility to a later date brings with it a number of psychological complications, which while they may interest the psychiatrist, are scarcely beneficial to either the individual or to society. This is Dorothy Sayers talking to Oxford in, I believe, 1948. What this leads to is an uneducated people, a people that only care about themselves. Sayers goes on, this is the same essay. She says, has it ever struck you as odd or unfortunate that today, again, 1948, when the proportion of literacy throughout the Western world is higher than it has ever been, People should have become susceptible to the influence of advertisement, mass propaganda, to an extent hitherto unheard of and unimagined. Do you put this down to mere mechanical fact that the press and the radio and so have made propaganda much easier to distribute over a wide area? Or do you sometimes have an uneasy suspicion that the product of modern educational methods is less good than he or she might be disentangling fact from opinion? and from the proven and the plausible. Again, this is Sayers. And we have seen this to be true. In fact, when I do info nights for the school, I point out that if you were to take a piece of writing from 150 years ago, let's say, uh, from a high school student, and you were to take a writing from who we now have in our universities here in Canada, and you were to hold them side to side, I think you would be astounded at how articulate the um, educated student of 150 to 200 years ago were. And so we want to look back and ask ourselves, well, what led to the education back then where it seemed we were more articulate, it seemed we were less inclined to propaganda? And what is happening now? But you might say, well, look at the amazing things that are happening happening right now. I can pull out my smartphone and I can have any fact in the world in three seconds. Isn't that amazing? I can make a call right now to the other side of the world if I was so inclined. We just witnessed a rocket go up into space and then come back down and land on a platform. Like, these are amazing things that are happening. How can you, Pastor Randy, say that our people are uneducated when it seems like all these things that are amazing are happening. Consider the internet, cell phones, information, all this. Well, what I believe is that the acquisition of knowledge does not equal true education. Without true education, we may know how to do much we may understand a lot of things, but when we're not truly educated, we don't understand what it is to actually be human, and we have nothing to govern our appetites. We only do, and we never ask the question if we should, and thus we enslave ourselves. C.S. Lewis said this, commenting on this fact, he said, I am very doubtful myself whether the benevolent impulse is stripped of, their pref of that preference and encouragement which the Tao teaches us to give them and left to, the, and left to their merely natural strength and frequency as psychological events will have much influence. I am very doubtful whether history shows us one example of a man who having stepped outside transitional morality or traditional morality and attained power has used that power benevolently benevolently. In other words, when you know how to do lots of things and that's all you know, but you don't understand morality and really what he's getting to is Christ, then what happens to that power? 
At the moment then, a man's victory over nature, we find that the whole human race subjected to some individual men and those individuals subjected to that in themselves which is purely natural, just their irrational impulses. Which leads us to how we got here. And I believe that's when we decided that it was the government's job in order to educate our children. We gave our children to the government and said, you decide what is education. We brought them to the public schools. And what I submit is if we truly want the presence of Christ in our education, then the education and what is taught has to be honored or has to honor Christ, and therefore the public schools cannot be an option. Now this talk isn't about the public schools, but I will give quickly three reasons why I think you should never give your kids to the public schools. Here's three of them. I did a talk many years ago, and they hold true. The first is safety. I don't think it's a safe place. My wife worked in them for a very long time, and then she would come home with stories of how one child would essentially take a class hostage, and the whole class would just leave and go to the library while that one child destroyed the classroom. He'd be back the next day. Educational assistants were wearing Kevlar, and they still are. I don't think it's particularly safe. Number two, I do think it's a bad education. I think the statistics show this very well. Our math scores, our, literally, our literacy scores, anything that shows how well we at least know our facts, how to read and how to do math, are dismal here in Ontario. And I think they're even more dismal in other places. And if those aren't bad enough, the third thing is the worst of all. When you send your kids to the public schools, you're in a position where they are told what is evil is good, and they are taught what is good is evil. This cannot honor Christ, and this cannot bring the presence of Christ into the educational sphere. You see, when the public schools started, and when Christianity was slowly getting squeezed out of it, we were told a myth. We were actually told a lie. And that is that you will give our kids to the public schools and they will be neutral in everything. They won't teach right from wrong. They'll just teach the facts and they'll teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. The three R's, which should show you that it's not a good education. <laughs> but that is a myth and that is a lie. Because education and where it comes from will always have a governing factor that goes over all of it. And when you say you're neutral, what you're actually saying is, we're going to pretend God it doesn't exist for the seven hours your kids are here. And we're going to teach them that, and then you can go do whatever you want at home. This does not under honor Christ, and this does not bring about the presence of Christ. It is a myth, because not only has this proven out to be true in history, but even when we were kids and we would say things were better, uh, we were being taught in a very subtle way not to think about God in every aspect of life. You were taught about science, but God didn't show up there. You were taught about math, God didn't show up there. You were taught about literature and books, but there was no mention of the Creator. And in having no mention of the Creator, what are they teaching? Well, they're teaching that the Creator is not important in that sphere, which is a lie. It's a myth. It is not true. When we think of progressive education, Robert Littlejohn gives three of their tenets. This is what they are. It places the student at the center of the educational process, displacing or ignoring the cultural tradition in which he or she stands. In other words, what becomes the most important thing is the student. What does the student like? What does the student care about? And the cultural um, milieu in which that student is, is meaningless. Number two, it educates students according to deterministic assessments of aptitude, prescribing college preparatory tracks for some and vocational education for others. But here's the kicker. Number three, it generali generally vocationalizes the educational process, training students primarily to function in the economy. 
and as I'll get to in a little bit, that is not education. But like I said, I could go on. But this is not a talk about public school bashing, as low-hanging that fruit is. This is a talk about the presence of Christ. And what I want to do is lift up a better way. Instead of just looking and saying, look how bad things are over here, I want us to say, not only do we need to cast that aside, but we need to do better, and we should have done better 50 years ago. We should have done better 100 years ago to get us in the mess that we're in. We need a way forward. You see, it's not enough to just remove the woke from our education and go back to the good old days when we were kids though I have heard that before. Instead, we need to shift our paradigm and ask if Christ is present in our education, and then what is the best way to foster this? And so for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to be doing is giving an apologetic for classical Christian education and why I believe it fosters a trellis on which the vine of God's presence can best grow when he manifests it. We can't call down God's presence on demand. We can't promise, hey, if you start a classical Christian school or if your homeschool shifts to the classical method, well, God's going to be there. That's not a promise I can make to you. But what I will say is when you take the tenets of classical Christian education and you are faithful to them, what you are doing is you are growing a trellis on which the vine of God's presence can grow in the life of your child so that when he or she grows, and when he and she or she is ready to be used by Christ, they will be even more effective because of it. First, we turn to what education is. In the quote I gave earlier, Lewis called something the Tao. And what the Tao was is what gives our heads the ability to govern our impulses and emotions. And traditionally, the way that the Tao has been cultivated is through what's called paideia. Paideia. Now, this is a biblical word. It's a Greek word. It's found in the Bible. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Ephesians 6.4. You've heard me talk about this before. You might be rolling your eyes. Let's go into Ephesians 6.4 again. Well, it's important. Ephesians 6, 4 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is a command of the Bible. This is a command to fathers and thus to households. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Some translations might say fear and admonition of the Lord. And the word discipline there in the ESV is the word paideia. What does it mean by this? When we say paideia, what are we talking about? Well, it's a worldview. Pete Hegseth, he summarizes it like this. Paideia, simply defined, represents the deeply seated affections, thinking, viewpoints, and virtues embedded in children at a young age, or more simply, the rearing, molding, and education of a child. This is what we are talking about. And really, it's taking the worldview of a child and cultivating it so that it is the worldview that that paideia would ascribe to. So for instance, at the time when Paul was writing Ephesians, and you use the word paideia, what they would be thinking of is how do we give our children the worldview that a good Roman citizen would have? How can they be equipped to be the best citizen in Rome? That's what would go through their mind. But you'll notice here that Paul doesn't just leave it at paideia, but he gives it an object. It's the paideia of something. It's not the paideia of Rome. It's not the paideia of the Greeks. Here it is, the paideia of the Lord. The worldview, the enculturation, the virtue embedding, that would please the Lord. This is what we are called to in this command by Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Joe Boot says this, it's a full-orbed Christian education 
And this is the logical outworking of biblical faith in obedience to the command to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. In the biblical worldview, children belong to God and parents are stewards charged with their care. And so what is our job? What is the purpose of education? Well, the purpose of education from a high standpoint is paideia. We want paideia that will help lead us and get us ready for the presence of Christ. Now, it's not just that paideia isn't happening in the public schools, but there is actually a new paideia being cultivated. A paideia or a worldview that isn't just trying to ignore Christianity, but it's now against Christianity. It's taking the virtues of the Christian faith as found in the Bible, and it's saying not only should we just not really think about them, but this is bad. And we have new virtues we want you to ascribe to. This is what progressive paideia is. In fact, this progressive paideia has infiltrated many so-called Christian schools, squandering their mission and leading them to impotence. Again, what we want is a paideia that will lead us to the presence of Christ. And this necessitates a new state of mind. I'm not arguing for a school per se. I'm not arguing for a way of educating. This is a way of educating that can be done at home. This is a way of educating that can be done at schools. But in the end, what we want to do is educate in such a way that not only is paideia happening, but we are ready for when the presence of Christ arrives. And in a way, when we consider classical Christian education, we must begin with a Christian. In other words, how can we have the presence of Christ while ignoring our Lord? Colossians 1.17 is very clear. Because there's going to be a governing factor, a principle that brings everything together, and the Bible is very clear about who this is, because this is found in a person. Colossians 1.17 says this, and he, this is, sorry, and he, yes, this is Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is before all things, and in him, in Jesus, in Christ, in our King, in our Lord, all things hold together. This brings all parts of our life under the Lordship of Christ. In other words, as we do education, we need to understand that it's not we have our reading and writing over here, we have our math and science over here, we have our Bible class over here, and man, we're never going to let these three things meet. No. They're all together under the Lordship of Christ. Christ is the Lord of mathematics, Christ is the Lord of science, Christ is the Lord of literature, of history, of all of life. There is no aspect of your life or my life that is outside of his lordship. And we need to understand this. And to teach in a way that does not foster this is to teach in a way that is not Christ-centered. You'll go to any Christian school, and I almost guarantee that Christ-centered will be in their literature. They'll give you their pamphlet, and it will say Christ-centered on it. But at the same time as saying Christ-centered, they will be very, very wiggly when you ask them, well, what about homosexuality? They'll be very, very wiggly when you ask very specific questions. Why? Because to them, being Christ-centered means that we sing songs to Jesus. But it is more than this. True Christian education is more than a Bible class. Consider what Van Til says. He said, but what then do we mean by education? Education is impl- implication into God's interpretation. No narrow intellectualism is implied in this definition. To think God's thoughts after him, to dedicate the universe to its maker, and to be vice-regent of the ruler of all things. This is man's task. Man is a prophet, priest, and king. It is this view of education that is involved in and demanded by the idea of creation. This is all under Christ's lordship. And really what we're educating is to fulfill the cultural mandate. 
we need to understand that if we are going to truly bring out a education that invites the presence of Christ, it has to be truly Christian, which means it has to put Christ in the center of everything that's done in that school or in that home. Without it, it is not Christian. We'll call it Christian in name only. Next, we have to again consider the purpose of education. And while I said before it was paideia, I want us to drill further into this idea. Why are we educating our children? What is the end goal? Well, many times when I ask this, I, I'll get answers like, well, you know, I need my children to be well off. I'm educating them such that they'll get a good job, they'll be able to afford a house, they'll do well in the economy. I mean, we have an election happening just down south, and what is everything that's being talked about? Everything that's being talked about is affordability, the economy, and this is all the things that are being talked about in our country here too. It's true in education. We think, well, why do I want my child to go to school? Well, I want him to go to a school that will make sure he's prepared to have a good job. Now, traditionally, this has not been the purpose of education. This is a very new concept when you think about educating children. Just getting them ready for a vocation maybe started about 200 years ago, and it really started with the factory. How can we have our children have the proper skill set in order to do the job they need to do. But it's something we can so easily fall into because we want our children to be well off. And so we think, well, how can we properly make sure they have the skills to code or to make sure that they have this skill or that skill? And we put the importance there instead of the importance where it needs to be, which is the traditional purpose of education and really the purpose of paideia which is this, it's wisdom and virtue. What paideia is, from our definition before, is how do we inform what wisdom is and what virtue is? And this has to be the end of education. You know that you could send your child to school, they get an amazing job, a, mi a million dollars a year job, they buy the biggest house in the city. They look, everyone looks up to them, and they look out at everyone, and people look up and say, wow, he has succeeded. But if they are a proud, unwise, unregenerate man, then what I say is you have failed as a parent in your education. We so easily want to look at the outward appearance and just say, well, this was successful. But traditionally, what we would look at is, is there wisdom here? More importantly, is there virtue here? This is what we need to do. This is what paideia is. And this is how we need to change the paradigm of what we think education is and what we think a successful education looks like. Thus, we get to what classical Christian education is. Can we define it? Well, there are many people that have defined it. I'll take one of Christopher Perrin's definitions. He defines it like this. Classical Christian education is a traditional approach to education rooted in Western civilization and culture, developed by the church, grounded in piety, and governed by theology, employing the historic curriculum and pedagogy of the several, seven liberal arts in order to cultivate men and women characterized by wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. Well, that's a pretty big definition. Did you all get it written down? I'll say it one more time because there's a lot of aspects to it, and I, he, he has shorter ones, but I picked this one for a reason. So I'll say it one more time. If you don't get it, you can come see me after. I can share it with you. Classical Christian education is a traditional approach to education, rooted in Western civilization and culture, developed by the church, grounded in piety and governed by theology, employing the historic curriculum and pedagogy of the seven liberal arts in order to cultivate men and women characterized by wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. And I want you to get the in order that. What's the end of it? It's the cultivation of children 
toward wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. This is what we want to do. Again, what we're seeking to do is bring about a way that we train our children such when the presence of Christ does arrive, they can be the most effective. It's not saying that the Lord cannot use those that are not educated in this way. Obviously, he does. But we still want to fulfill our role as parents in Ephesians 6, 4 says. So what does this mean? Well, like I said, it's traditional and it's rooted in Western civilization and culture. And so when we think about West, or when we think about classical Christian education, again, the first thing I want you to think of is how Christ-centered it is, because that has to be the overarching way that we look at every single thing in education. But then the next thing that I think is important as we discuss what classical Christian education is, is that it is rooted in Western civilization and the great works of Western civilization. In other words, it's an education linked with history. It's rooted in heritage. It's rooted in the history and heritage, actually, of Christian thought. Gene Edward Veith says this, Western civilization is the property of all who live in America, and I'll say Canada. Our natural, national roots have grown deep in the customs, traditions, discoveries, and conversations that make up American, British, European, Greek, Roman, in Hebrew history. It is our privilege to receive and to share this heritage, and it is just as immoral to keep it from others as it is to despise our heritage. Now, we live in a time where our heritage is despised. And in fact, we think of people in the past as being absolute Neanderthals. Why would we look to the past? We've got it all figured out right now, we say. But what classical education does is we think back and we say, wait a second, let's hold the brakes or pull the brakes here. It's like, no. It's actually unbiblical, unwise, and wrong to throw away all of our history. We have the ability to stand on the shoulders of giants. And we need to take this. It's very biblical, as I said, and it's actually, I would argue, anti-biblical to ignore the past and consider ourselves the only generation that's ever figured it out. And I submit that when you get to progressive education, that is the underlying assumption. We have progressed beyond the past, and now we don't have to think about over here because we are so far beyond it. This is what's taught in a very, very insidious way in the public schools and in some Christian schools. What I would rather do is look to the past and lift it up and say, see what we can learn, although it might not be perfect. Like I said, this is biblical. Consider Deuteronomy 6. I'll read from Deuteronomy 6, verse 20. This is the passage with the famous Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then later, it says this, one of my favorite passages in Scripture. 6.20 says, When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and rules that the Lord our God has commanded you, then you shall say to your son. In other words, we live very crazily compared to everyone else. Why? This is what your son says. You say to your son, then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he commanded us. What were they to do? They were to tell the stories of what happened of old. And when they forgot them, that's when problems arose. Consider Joshua chapter 4. The Israelites have just entered the promised land. In fact, miraculously, they crossed the Jordan. And what are they told to do? Verse 21. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? 
Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did in the Red Sea, when he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and you may fear the Lord your God. The stones were built up such that they would remember what happened. We are not to despise our heritage. In fact, go to Psalm 78. This is the songbook of the people. So the people would have sung this. Verses 1 to 4. It's a masculine of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my teachings, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of, of old. We learn, talking of Christ, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Then it says, verse 4, We will not hide from their children, but tell to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And it goes on to say what he has done for Israel. And again, we need to understand our history, and part of our history is the thought behind those in history. My point is that an education with no link to the past, even just beyond history class, is not as honoring to the Lord as one that goes back and lifts high the saints of old. And so we must show our students that we are part of a great story. We must show them that they are in this great story, and we must show them where they fit into this story, because they do. There are men who wrote and thought, as I said, whose shoulders we are to stand on. The tearing down of statues is not honoring to the Lord, and we are to be a people who not only knows our history, but know the thinking of those who went before us. This is why we need to read old books. This is part of what classical education is. It's why old books are part of a classical Christian education. Why we read things that have stood the test of time, as we say. Books that not have only lasted decades, but have lasted centuries, and some that not only have lasted centuries, but have lasted millennia. The ones that stay have something to say that we should pay attention to. But when you think of the great books programs, you might think, well, not all these works are Christian, are they? Well, the answer is no. In fact, at King Alfred Academy in grade 9, one of the first major works that we look at is the Iliad. And I don't know if I'm going to spoil this for you, but Homer was not a Christian. And so that brings up the question of Tertullian, which says, well, then what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Why don't we just study books that are explicitly Christian? Well, I have two answers to this. First, there is common grace. And just because something is not explicitly Christian does not mean that there is nothing to learn from it. But secondly and more importantly, part of a classical Christian is to look at the works of old and then to take that worldview, which is different than ours, and analyze that worldview by the worldview that is found in Christ in the Bible. And so we don't take the books of literature, the great books of literature, and we hold it on the same par as the Bible, and we say, look at how much we have to learn. No, what we do is we take the books of literature and we hold them under the Bible, and we say, well, let's analyze this and see what is good and what is bad and why it's bad, and then this is how we learn what the Christian worldview is. There are great thoughts in the Iliad, this is an epic poem, and there's a reason why everyone for, or many, many people, for well over 2,000 years has studied it. But that doesn't mean we take everything as a gospel truth. No, we take it, we analyze it, we bring it to the Bible, and we teach our children how to do that, because even as they go out into the world, what will they have to do? They will have to analyze different worldviews against the Bible. And so we teach them to do that, in the safety of the classroom. In bringing forth the Western tradition, we are building on Christian thought. We are taking the best of Christian thought and education, the best of even thought and education, and giving it to our children so that when the presence of Christ arrives, they are well-read and well-thought students ready to be used. And we do so by linking our education 
to the past. Another thing as we talk about classical Christian education is the seven liberal arts. This is the curriculum. This is what we would call the tools of learning. You see, when we think of the seven liberal arts, what are they? They're the liberal arts. The root of liberal is freedom. They're the arts that free. This is what it is. And when you look at how the arts were looked at, you had the liberal arts, there were seven of them, and then you had the common arts. The liberal arts were for the free man. The liberal arts were for those who were to be able to think and lead society, and the common arts were meant for those that would just work. Now, there's a place for both, okay? But what we want to do is we want to teach our children the way to think to be free, a free person, knowing that true freedom only comes upon being a slave of Christ, which is why, again, and I'll stress it more as we finish up, we must be Christ-centered because Christ is our true master. Well, the seven liberal arts, they are thus. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric form the trivium, the three ways. This is where it begins, and then it goes into the quadrivium, which is music or arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Now, we'll talk about the trivium for a little bit. The trivium, the three ways, again, are the grammar, the logic, and the rhetoric. And I'm going to read a fairly substantial portion from Dorothy Sayers' essay, The Lost Tools of Learning. And I want you to consider what she says about these things. It says this, Now the first thing we notice is that two at any rate of these subjects are not what we should call subjects at all. They are, not, they are only methods of dealing with subjects. Grammar indeed can be a subject in the sense that it does mean definitely learning a language. At that present period, it meant learning Latin. But language itself is simply the medium in which thought is expressed. The whole of the trivium was, in fact, intended to teach the pupil the proper use of the tools of learning before he began to apply them to subjects at all. First, he learned a language. Not just how to order a meal in a foreign language, but the structure of a language. A language, and hence of language itself, what it was, how it was put together, and how it worked. Secondly, he learned how to use language, how to define his terms and make accurate statements, how to construct an argument and how to detect fallacies in argument, his own arguments and other people's. Dialectic, that is to say, embraced logic and disputation. Thirdly, he learned to express himself in language, how to say and appear the better, how to be restrained by his previous teaching in dialectic. If not, his teacher and his fellow pupils trained along the same lines would be quick to point out where he was wrong, for it was they whom he had to seek to persuade. At the end of his course, he was required to compose a thesis upon some theme set by his masters or chosen by himself, and afterward, to defend this thesis against criticism of the faculty. By this time, he would have learned, or woe betide him, not merely to write an essay on paper, but to speak audibly and intelligibly from a platform, or to use his wits quickly when heckled. Heckling, moreover, would not consist solely of offensive personalities or of irrelevant queries about what Julius Caesar said in, five, in 55, though no doubt medieval dialectic was enlivened and practiced by plenty of such primitive repartee. But there would also be questions, cogent and shrewd, from those who had already run the gauntlet of debate and were making ready to run it. Now, there are those who don't like what Sayers does in linking the trivium to the different uh, developmental ways. But I do think that there is a lot of wisdom in using the trivium as a paradigm for how we teach our children. You see, as we learn things, there is a grammar to them. It's the fundamentals of them, we could say. Once we learn the fundamentals, we get into what's called, we call it the logic phase, which is the argumentative phase, or taking the fundamentals and utilizing them well. And then finally, you get to the the rhetoric stage where you make it eloquent.
Some of you will have heard this, but the example I love to give is one of woodworking. So there's a grammar to woodworking. There's fundamentals of woodworking. You have to learn how to cut a board and measure it and plane it and join it properly and sand it well and all these fundamentals that if you don't do that, you're not even getting into the game. But once you've taken those fundamentals and mastered them, well, what can you do? You can take it and you can build a chair. You can argue with the fundamentals and actually build something. A chair that you sit on, it holds your weight, though someone might look at it and wonder if it's a chair because of how ugly it is. Finally, you get to the rhetoric stage, and what happens is you hone your craft such that you take the fundamentals, you take the way that you've Learn those fundamentals and place them together and you become eloquent with it such that you produce a chair that someone would pay $10,000 for because of how beautiful it is. This is our goal and this is what we want to do. We want to give our children the tools of learning so that they don't just know facts, but they now know a path to go from not knowing anything to mastery. This is what we seek to do here at King Alfred Academy and I know many of you seek to do in your homes as you utilize the trivium really as a scaffold to teach from in this way. We move on to the quadrivium, which again is kind of the natural science, maths and science and music. And we bring together the seven liberal arts. But for the sake of time, we'll just talk about two more things. First, When we consider classical education, we're considering focused subjects. We're not trying to get a smorgasbord of subjects for the children to to pick from. Instead, what we want to do is bring students and delve as deep as we can. The idea is we would rather be an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. That's the idea. And so we will learn less things, but we will learn them more deeply Again, so that the tools of learning are done in a way that brings and leads to mastery. That's the goal. Now, this is a growing movement, especially here in Ontario. There's schools starting every year. It's amazing to see. There could be a school near you. I know that there's many homeschoolers that have switched to this, and my point is this. As we consider the presence of Christ, as we consider how looking at the tradition of the Western Christian heritage and then utilizing the liberal arts and especially the trivium, working toward mastery, we can produce children that are ready to be used when Christ does arrive. Now, there's a few things I want to bring to your attention. Our school does have a booth just over there. We're tucked in the corner. I don't know what that means, but it is the corner. We have this uh, magazine here by the Association of Classical Christian Schools. It's called the Good Soil Report. And again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into it too much. But if you're interested in classical Christian education and the outcomes that it produces, in, in Ontario, it's very new. We're talking less than a decade. In the United States, the classical Christian renewal is much older. Uh, it was started in the late 70s, early 80s, and there's a lot of data now that we can see. And what the Good Soil Report does is it looks at outcomes and where students who have graduated from various forms of education are, and it just compares them. And it shows those who are classically educated, um, their outcomes are more honoring to God than those who weren't. That's all I'll say. You can have a look at it. It's in the magazine, and I do highly recommend it. Next, if you just want to dive in a little bit more, this is your very first time, This little guide by Chris Perrin is great. It's called Introduction to Classical Education. They're at our table as well. You can grab one of those. And then finally, uh, this book is called The Battle for the American Mind. Uh, It goes into the problem with the progressive secular education and what Pete Hegseth does uh, with the help of David Goodwin, who's the president of the Association uh, for Classical and Christian Schools, as he looks at classical education and what he calls the Western Christian paideia as the answer to what is going on in America and even Canada. And uh, it's a very uh, accessible book, easy to read and well worth your time. And they're all at the table over there.
And what we're saying for this, just because uh, we do have a budget, is if you donate anything to the school, uh, you can grab a book, okay? So um, I do highly recommend it, though. It's well worth the read. In conclusion, without the presence of Christ, we work in vain. Our goal in prayer needs to be in Christ's presence in our educational endeavors. This is true if you run a school, if you send your children to a school, or if you homeschool. I believe that through, Christ, through its Christ-centered approach, and with a focus on the Western tradition and the usage of the liberal arts, especially the trivium, classical Christian education, while not having the ability to call down the presence of Christ, like some kind of incantation, what it does is it sets our students up so that when Christ does show up, they are best prepared to be utilized by him to the maximum wherever he has them serve. We want to produce leaders in the church. We want to produce leaders in the community, leaders in the home. I would love to see homemaking moms that are better equipped to think than the college professors down the road. Plumbers that could enter a philosophical debate and uphold Christ as God. Farmers that talk about Augustine and Aquinas and Calvin and Lewis. As Christians, we should be amongst the best educated because we wish to honor Christ and we desire his presence, and we have the heritage to fall back on. And so I uphold classical Christian education of a way of doing this. Let's pray, and then I might, well, let's pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we're very thankful for um, the ability and even the mandate to educate. What a glorious thing it is to be able to teach children and see when their eyes light up, when they get a concept, and to be able to uphold Christ as worthy of our praise and as Lord of all. I pray that every parent here would do so, whether it's through a school or at their home, and I pray they would do so in a way that would best prepare them for the presence of Christ in their lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think we have time for a Q&A, so I will be over at the table there if you have any questions. I'd love to talk with you. Thank you so much, and God bless. Thank you.